Well, hello, John. Thank you for jumping on a call. Happy 2020. Um, you have written some amazing works of art and books, and you've been an active lecturer, but it sounds like your career started in corporate America and in economics. Can you tell us a little bit about how, um, how you became, I guess, an economic hitman? And um, tell us a little bit about basically how that corporate structure works. Yes, uh, Taya. So my my uh, my I graduated from business school and then went into Peace Corps, where I was lived in the in Ecuador in the Amazon for a couple of years, and in the Andes with indigenous people in both places in the Andes for another year. So about three years in the Peace Corps. When I came out, I was recruited by a Boston consulting firm, Charles T. Maine, uh, and uh, they I was recruited as an economist to work in overseas countries. Pretty quickly, I, I became chief economist. Uh, they had a couple of other economists that they'd had on board who, who weren't able to really handle themselves in, <laughs> in strange countries doing economic reports. So I moved up pretty quickly and ended up having a staff of, of anywhere from, from two to, to four dozen people. Uh, and really my job, although I was called chief economist, my real job was as an economic hitman. So what I was supposed to do was, was have my staff identify countries that had resources our corporations wanted, like oil or other resources, and then to go to those countries and arrange huge loans from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations to those countries, get those countries to accept these huge loans. And the conditions of the loans were that the countries would, would hire U.S. corporations primarily engineering companies or companies like General Electric and others, to build big infrastructure projects in the country, things like power plants and industrial parks and ports, uh, things that made big profits for our U.S. corporations uh, and helped a few wealthy families in those countries, including the ones who ruled the country. And, and, and they own the industries, they own the commercial establishments, the shopping malls, things that, that really benefited from more electricity, from better ports, uh, from industrial parks, et cetera. But in the process, money was diverted uh, from education and healthcare and other social services that helped most people uh, diverted to, in order to pay off the interest on, on the loans that, that, that these countries had accepted. So the poor, the middle class and the poor people really suffered from these conditions while the rich benefited extensively, and our own corporations made big profits. And in the end, the country couldn't pay off its the principal on the, the loan. It was just too much. So we'd go back, usually under the guise of the, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and, re, and offer to restructure the loans. But that involved the country basically selling its resource, like oil, very cheaply to our corporations without environmental or social regulations or privatizing its biggest industries, its utility companies, its water and sewage companies, its maybe its education systems, perhaps its, its prison system, and selling them to our investors at cheap prices or cut, cut rate prices or allowing us to build a military base on their soil or, or, or having to vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba or some such thing. So really what we were doing was building this corporate empire. And I have to say that in the few cases where uh, heads of countries did not accept these loans, did not accept these conditions, people we call the jackals stepped in. And these were people who are usually CIA contractors who overthrew or um, assassinated country leaders. You know, there's many examples of that. Allende in, in Chile and Arbenz in Guatemala and Mossadegh in Iran and Lumumba in the Congo and much more recently, uh, Zelaya in Honduras just a few years ago. Um, so so it, it was really a, a, a fairly easy sell for me to could go in and tell these rulers of countries that they could get projects that would make them and their friends a lot of money um, or they could face the consequences that leaders of other countries had faced and, and suffered with, either through coups or, or assassinations. And that was really uh, my job. And then my, then my staff would produce these very fancy economic studies and reports that showed how good these loans were for the economy. Because the fact of the matter is, when you invest money in these systems, these infrastructure systems, 
the economy grows, the GDP grows. And so it looked really good. And for many years, I thought I was doing the right thing because in business school, we're taught that if you can make the GDP, the economy grow, uh, you're doing, you're benefiting everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, what I didn't realize until later was that statistics like that are really skewed in favor of the rich. Mm -hmm. So in most of these countries, a few families make up most of the GDP. We know that that's true in the United States today. Three individuals have as much wealth as, as, half, as the bottom half of the population. So if they're doing well, it looks good for the whole economy. So after, after a number of years, I began to see that the system was really a, a, a colonialistic an imperialistic system that was not helping the majority of people in these countries. It was hurting them. Well, thank you for coming forward with this information. Um, I don't know what percent of the population is aware that there's a strategic business plan actually that's involved in a lot of these relationships. I think as the American public, we watch things happen. Things happen in the Middle East and we just don't understand why these things are happening. And it's interesting and I think it's bewildering almost that there are people whose job it is to set these dynamics in motion. And it's very much intentional. And um, I think one of the interesting things that I've kind of observed, and I think there's been a lot of questions, I think has been our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Obviously, recently they were basically caught on the public space stage for killing an American citizen. And I think there were a lot of Americans that were asking why we have such a strong relationship with Saudi Arabia. I know in one of your books, you talk about that a little bit. Can you give us some background? Well, yeah, it's, uh, and I, 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 one of my projects was in Saudi Arabia. I talk about it in the book, which was called the Saudi Arabia Money Laundering mm -hmm. <laughs> Affair. Um, and I go into detail in the book about how that worked, but basically what we were we were doing was was offering uh, protection to Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and the uh, the royal family, uh, the, the Saud family in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, offered to keep, keep them in power if they would work closely with our oil companies, if they would only sell oil for the U.S. dollar. There were a number of other conditions in there. This happened after the war in the Middle East where Saudi Arabia basically was in a very strong position and it was the head of OPEC mm -hmm. and they caused a huge, they, they, they basically boycotted the United, the United States and some of our European allies not to not, not sell oil. And we mm -hmm. caused a big recession in this country in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And so I was hired to go to Saudi Arabia and convince the leaders to lay off that. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, we would give them protection uh, we, we would see to it that you know Israel, Israel and, and other neighboring countries wouldn't attack them, and that the and we also see to it that the, that the House of Saud, a very dictatorial, authoritarian, brutal dictatorship at the time, and still is, as, as you point out with the Khashoggi affair, um, would stay in power. So there was this deal struck, and the deal is still maintained, uh, mm. and so that's a part of why uh, we protected Saudi Arabia during this process, why the administration protected Saudi Arabia. I also think it goes beyond that in terms of, I think the Bush, I'm sorry, I think the Trump administration may have some other more personal ties with Saudi Arabia. In fact, I'm pretty certain they do, mm -hmm. uh, that they wanted to protect. And furthermore, um, Saudi Arabia, it's not only about oil in Saudi Arabia, it's also about the fact that Saudi Arabia buys a huge amount of arms from us. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they profit our arms industry significantly. And when they do that, it also forces other countries around them, including countries that, that feel threatened by Saudi Arabia, to buy more weapons. Mm -hmm. So these, this, what's going on in the Middle East, some of it's about oil, some of it's about strategic location, and some of it's simply the fact that wars are extremely profitable for a lot of U.S. businesses. So th there's a lot of material there to unpack. Now, when arms dealing is beneficial, is it beneficial to the U.S. government or is it just specific entities within the United States? Well, it's, and it's, it's not just arms sales. Mm -hmm. It's also everything that's connected with that. So the computers that go into it, you know, the computer companies benefit, the, high, the technology companies benefit. It isn't just the ones that make the missiles and the weapons. Mm -hmm. It's the insurance industry benefits, the banking industry, Wall Street benefits. So this what we call in economic terms, the spin-offs mm -hmm. for selling arms are huge and they mm -hmm. affect 
they affect food production uh, because of the, you know the people in the factories eat food and buy and, and consume. So it's a huge, huge business, and uh, it, it you know it, it benefits those businesses, but it benefits an awful lot of other people too. And many, many politicians in the United States are directly or indirectly benefited from that because it helps the economy in their states, the states that they represent. So they they often push for these things. Now, is it possible to pivot and focus on another business area, for example, sustainability? Is that feasible? Oh, in fact, that's what we need to do. And I have a book coming out in June called Touching the Jaguar transforming fears into actions to change our life in the world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the idea of touching the jaguar comes from an indigenous Amazonian term that w- th- 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 when you see something that you fear, like change, uh, if you run from it, it'll chase you. If you touch it, it'll give you its power to move forward and change. Mm-hmm. And, and right now our jaguar is a, a fear of change. Mm-hmm. So although we know that we that the oceans are rising, the glaciers are melting. We know there's climate change. We know that there's many species going extinct around the world at totally unacceptable rates. Uh, we know that there's a huge amount of divert uh, of discrepancy between the the world's rich and the world's poor, and include that includes in the United States the inequality gap. Uh, even though we know all that, it most of us are afraid of change. Mm-hmm. You know. People like probably most of your listeners, and I include myself in this, Mm -hmm. you know, we live pretty good lives. Mm -hmm. We're not sure we want to rock the boat. And more than half the world's population can't even think about change because all they think about is putting food on the table for Mm -hmm. their kids for the next meal. And then there's the people at the very top of the economic pyramid who don't, who think that they've totally got it made. You know, they're they're the bosses. They're making all the money. They Mm -hmm. don't want change. So we, we fear this change. And what we've really created, this whole system I've described, this economic hitman system, and it is based on the, the concept that the responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits for a few sh- shareholders, mm-hmm. short-term. And that's what Wall Street drives for. And that has created this economic system that many economists today are referring to as a death economy. Mm-hmm. It's an economic system that is destroying itself. It's, it's consuming itself into, into, into extinction. It's, it's using up all of its resources very quickly. Mm-hmm. And it's also polluting the planet. Right. And it's also, to a large degree, based on selling war. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So the answer is to change that, to touch that Jaguar and say, we must change that and let's create a life economy. Mm-hmm. Let's pay Let's pay the General Dynamics and Raytheon and all the companies that make war equipment or, or that make it, all the companies that are polluting, that are causing climate change. Let's instead pay them and, and create jobs for new entrepreneurs mm-hmm. to, to create a life economy, an economic system that cleans up pollution and that regenerates destroyed environments, Mm -hmm. that recycles and creates new technologies that don't rob from the earth. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we've just, you know, we just touched on that. We just hit the tip of the iceberg with solar and wind today, which are becoming extremely successful. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, those technologies are still in their infancy. We can only begin to imagine what, if if we diverted our tax dollars and 51 cents of every U.S. tax dollar mm-hmm. goes to the military and the discretionary fund. Mm-hmm. And if we can, if we, instead of paying these companies to continue to make these deathly products, if instead we paid them to come up with methods for mining all the plastic in the oceans mm-hmm. and for ge- regenerating all the terribly destroyed uh, environments around the world and to create technologies that we can't even conceive of today that will transform air into energy that will trans you know there's just it's it's just it's it's almost it's unimaginable as to where we could go with this and create a true life economy an economic system that is itself a renewable resource so what do you think the average person needs to do in order to encourage that to happen what are, are some of our paths towards success yeah, I, I, and that's that's a very personal question for people. 
uh, I, I, and in this book that's coming out in June, Touching the Jaguar, which mm-hmm. incidentally you can pre-order on any of the online <laughs> services or any bookstore. Um, yeah, in this book, I really outline things that we we each can do, uh, but it's it's really a process of looking at what what can you what can you personally do that satisfies your greatest desire. You touch your own jaguar. How do you move into uh, creating a situation where where you've you've developed a lifestyle that you really really want for yourself, and that is consistent with going into this life economy? I can give a couple of examples. So. I love to write, Mm -hmm. and I I think, I hope I have some skills in it. So I devote myself to writing, but I'm always writing about these days about creating a life economy, Mm -hmm. about about this change. So writers should do that. Actors, television producers, movie producers, anybody who's involved, artists, musicians. Let's focus on on creating this this knowledge that we can do much better. Mm -hmm. If you're a carpenter... um, you know, you you commit to, to building with sustainable materials and to letting your clients know that and by saying you know, things like, well, it might it might seem like it costs you a little bit more right now, but that's actually not a cost. That's an investment in the future. Mm-hmm. You're investing in the future by being sustainable. Plumber can do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got a podcast. You, you you continually do shows that will that will promote this idea. Mm-hmm. So every person out there who's listening has uh, passion Mm -hmm. and every person has talents. And so what I encourage everybody to do is look to your passions. What is it that bring you the greatest joy in life? Follow that Mm -hmm. and use your skills in that way, but make sure you're also directing it toward toward a life economy. And, and And if we all do that, we'll achieve it fairly quickly. This is this this is an easy road, really, mm-hmm. when you come right down to it. We're not talking about moving back into caves or something. We're talking right. about having really good lifestyles, but we're changing the way that we uh, run our economy. And it isn't about maximizing short-term profits. It becomes uh, the success story for businesses and everybody else is to create long-term benefits for all. What a fantastic message to start off the new year. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I, and I'd like to add to that it's it's happening. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, 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 the New Green Deal is an example. The B corporations and the benefit corporations are, are examples. Uh, community banks and so forth are examples. And last August, 192 of the world's top CEOs at the conference board uh, made a commitment to doing exactly this. They said profits should not be our biggest motivating force anymore. It's, we, we need to pay a decent rate of return to our investors, but we also need to take really good care of our employees our consumers and the communities where we work. So th- this is happening. It's it's not pie in the sky. It's happening. We just need to encourage it to happen more and more and more. Now, obviously, we are at the precipice of a lot of transformation that's aided by artificial intelligence and robotics. How do you think that conversation will will play into this Green Deal? Well. Uh, you know, it's a <laughs> it, there's a crystal ball here mm. that we have to look into. But <clears throat> my hope mm-hmm. is that um, that cybernetics, robotics, all these technologies uh, can make us look at the world, help us look at the world in a more objective way. Mm-hmm. So the robots, if you want to call it the AI, the artificial intelligence, is not biased uh, against any particular system or idea. It doesn't need to be anyway. Mm-hmm. It can be designed to be, but it doesn't need to be. Right. It, and it can be totally objective. And if, if you were to, to look at this, like, let's say an AI is, is, is observing from almost like from outer space and looking down at this planet mm-hmm. uh, and looking objectively and saying, hey, you human beings just can't go on the way that you're you're doing it. Mm-hmm. You've got to come together. The Russians, the Chinese, uh, the Americans. We you have to come together to re- re- recognize that you, we all that we all live on a very fragile space station, the Earth, and we're in the, we're navigating it toward disaster. Mm-hmm. And and so AI could tell us that's what's happening. And look, you've all got to come together, and you've got to start moving toward a life economy. Mm-hmm. And we could use robotics to help make that happen. Uh, and and free people up from doing very menial, tough jobs sometimes that nobody really wants to do mm-hmm. for 
seven and a half dollars an hour, or sure. whatever the minimum wage is, and that's the national minimum wage. It's higher in some states, and free people up to do more creative things. Now, that's that's my hope. Of course, the other possibility that, that people will paint is that r- robotics and AI could be used by some, you know, sort of Doctor No from the uh, James Bond movie, some, mm. you know, some, some. Um, force that's out there that that really wants to create havoc and and create problems in the world. There are those two possibilities. I want to believe that we're going to move toward the right one. And I think all of us need to push to make that happen and Mm -hmm. and not be afraid of the the coming technology because it's it's here, it's coming. Mm -hmm. But to to really, really pressure our, our, our elected officials, the corporations we work for, where we buy from, we invest in to pressure all these people to do the right thing, to move toward a life economy and use the incredible uh, powers of new technology to make that happen. Great perspective. I think when you talk to people about some of these issues, I think one of the things that you are addressing with, with your work is for the individual to feel empowered and Oftentimes you talk to someone and they don't recycle only because they feel that the problem is so huge that their individual efforts will not make a difference. How do you talk and how do you motivate people to overcome that bias? Well, you know, that's kind of a story that's sold to us by those who want to keep the status quo, the ones, as I mentioned, at the very top of the pyramid, those Three individuals, or the, you know, there's a, with the one percent that that controls so much of the world's economy. Mm-hmm. They they want us to believe that it's too big, but it's not too big. It's you know, we've been through many many times in history. Uh, people could have said, well, back during World War II, people could have said, well, Hitler's just too powerful. He's taking over all of Europe, and the United States shouldn't get involved and let him have Europe. And then who knows what might have happened. Um, we could have said the same thing during World War One. We could have said it during the Depression. We could have said it uh, when I was a young person. We were terrified of the Soviet Union that was winning the space war by sending up the first Sputnik, the first uh, satellite, and first people into space. But instead, John Kennedy said, "No, we're we're, we're going to be land, be the first to land a man on the moon and bring him back, and then we're going to do it in ten years," which seemed impossible. Seemed mm-hmm. absolutely impossible. What's this president is crazy? Mm-hmm. But it happened. And we faced these kinds of things throughout history, uh, things that seemed uh, impossible, but they're not impossible. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's important to understand that the human reality, let's call it objective reality, mm-hmm. is really controlled by a perception of reality. Mm-hmm. There's no United States, there's no Russia. Mm-hmm. There's no religion, there's no culture, there are no corporations Mm -hmm. until uh, people perceive them as such. Mm -hmm. And then when enough people perceive these things and codify it into law, it becomes, it has a huge impact on what we call objective reality. All of our institutions, human Mm -hmm. institutions, they all came out of perceptions. Mm -hmm. Today we have a perception that businesses need to maximize short-term profits Individuals need to maximize short-term benefits. We need to buy more stuff. We need whatever we need. You know, we need to listen to the advertisements. Mm-hmm. If you don't own this kind of a car, you're not worth anything. You know right. that kind of thing. That's a, those are all perceptions, mm-hmm. and we have this perception that we've that we're stuck in this death economy, and we we can't get out of it. Uh, that that that's just too big. But that's that's a false per- perception. And so we really need to open ourselves to this perception that change is entirely possible and must happen. And it's going to be fun to make it happen. Mm-hmm. We're all going to move into a better life when we really follow our hearts and, and do these things. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a very, very powerful message. And I, 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 again, I believe it is, it is absolutely happening. We're seeing, we're seeing this happen. We're seeing a consciousness change around the world. Mm-hmm. I have the privilege and I'm blessed to have the privilege to because my some of my books have sold more than two million copies and they're in over 35 languages to travel around the world speaking at many different kinds of venues you know I, I've, I've sp- I spoke at a huge economic conference in St. Petersburg Russia and then shortly after that in the Czech Republic at a rock festival 
and I speak at conscious capitalist uh, organizations and universities, tremendous variety. But everywhere I go, in all these different kinds of audiences, I, people are coming, they want to hear, they want to be mo- motivated. They, they, they know that this change is in the air. It's happening, it's got to happen, it's going to happen. So there really is, I think, a consciousness revolution that people are waking up to the fact that we, we absolutely must change, that we must change the navigational system of this of the space station that we live on this earth. Mm-hmm. We, must, we must steer us ourselves away from disaster and towards something much more beautiful. Now, speaking of change in perception, I actually was on uh, some kind of a post the other day, and uh, I'm Persian myself, and I saw a comment about uh, someone was saying that Iran will basically attack the United States and will be the beginning of the end. And I almost nearly laughed because I you know, thought to myself that you're afraid of a small country that's on the other side of the planet uh, that doesn't have nukes or ICBMs, uh, that is under an economic embargo, doesn't really have medicine for its own people, but you really truly have this fear for this tiny little country. And I know in the book you address, and I don't know if you personally were involved with uh, some of what happened prior to the revolution, but can you kind of put that into perspective for us? Yeah, I was very involved in Iran. I I was there for over a period of 10 years. I I probably spent a total of about a year in Iran at different times. I had an office in Mm -hmm. Tehran. Mm -hmm. uh, And I, you know, was essentially, I mean, my company was was hired by by the the Shah's government to Mm -hmm. develop projects there. So we were close to the Shah and close to that regime. And, you know, the Shah was was put into power by the CIA when Mossadegh was overthrown Mm -hmm. in the early 1950s uh, because uh, he was was truly a Democrat. And and he was trying to get the oil companies, the foreign oil companies, to give the Iranian people a fair share of the profits they were making in Iran. And he was elected president democratically. And and then uh, the oil companies were strongly objected. And and the U.S. and Britain uh, stood behind the oil companies and eventually overthrew Mossadegh and replaced him with uh, uh, the Shah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Shah was never really a legitimate leader. Uh, and while we were working there, while I was working there, I, I didn't have any idea that the Shah was as unpopular as he was. And part of that was because I and most Americans working there, most foreigners working there, did not speak Farsi, mm-hmm. the, the language of the language of Iran. Uh, we had to always work through interpreters, and the mm. interpreters all <laughs> worked for the Shah, you know, essentially. Mm, right. And they'd all been trained, you know, in our schools, and they were part of the system. And so we weren't really getting a lot of information that we should have been getting. Mm-hmm. So the, the Shah was a, a brutal guy. Uh, he shouldn't have been, he never should have been there. We, we should have supported Mossadegh, who was democratically elected, and said, yes, the oil companies should pay a fair share of their, of their profits, just like they do in the United States. So they should do in the United States recently. They, some of them haven't been paying any taxes here either. That's not right either. Mm-hmm. But, but um, so, well, you know, so... Then the the mullahs took over, and, and which is mentioned as the revolution. I, I was I was ushered out by a CIA agent just mm-hmm. before the, the bombing started in the late seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, I write about that in the books, and um, and you know that's a despotic regime too. I'm, I'm not I'm not in any way in favor of of what's uh, what the current administration in Iran is doing. Uh, I, I but I also, as you said. It's a small country without nuclear weapons, and they may be trying to develop them, but then they're surrounded by countries that have them. Mm-hmm. You know, if you were if you were Iranian, you'd you'd want to you'd want to have the same thing that the Russians just north of you have, and this and and, and the Indians and the Pakistanis, Pakistanis yeah. and, the, and the Americans who are you know in Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. All these nuclear weapons that surround Iran, and yet we say, well, you can't have them. Everybody else has got them, but you can't have them. Um, I, you know, I think Iran, it, 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 I don't, you know, I never have seen Iran as a, as a threat to us. It's, Iran's not going to come to the United States and attack the United States. It doesn't have that kind of power. The only threat Iran has is, you know, as a, as a local uh, economic power and and sending forces into places like Iraq 
in Syria, it does do that. And it does that partly because it feels that it needs to protect itself. The Iranians, and when I was in Russia recently, I met with some very high up Russian officials who pointed out to me that Russia uh, is, many people in Russia are convinced that the United States is in Iraq and, and Syria and that part of the world because we all, uh, we ultimately want to take over Iran, mm-hmm. which is on the doorstep to Russia. And our motive is to move into Russia and take over Russia. Right. Now, I'm not saying, I don't believe that, but mm-hmm. that's, that's a very strong belief in Iran and Russia. Right. And, and so they have that perception. Mm-hmm. And we have the perception that they are trying to take us over. Mm-hmm. And those are both false perceptions, mm-hmm. but they're very dangerous ones. Mm-hmm. And so we all need to really work hard to try to change that and, and totally realize that we must come together, all of us, the Iranians, the Russians, the Americans, the Israelis, the Palestinians, and realize that our whole planet is being threatened by our way of life and our economic system, and we've got to come together to change that. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to give you an, a, a great model for that, Thea, is, is, is that, that, that um, and I write about in this new book. In the Amazon, I was there as the Peace Corps volunteer, as I mentioned earlier, in the late 60s. At that time, there were all these tribes, Amazonian tribes, that were killing each other. They were fighting. It was over territory, over hunting grounds, and they, to protect my hunting ground, the one tribe would say, we have to keep our neighbors off it. We have to fight them. And these these wars had gone on for centuries. And then they saw that the real threat to their territory was foreign oil companies coming in. And so they came together, these, these ancient enemies. They formed a federations to come together to legally, not physically. They knew they couldn't fight the drones and you know all the weapons that the oil companies could bring to their side. But they, but they came together and, and they created a huge resistance movement and stopped the oil companies. But in the process, they also recognized that the real threat was what they call the dream of our nations, of mm-hmm. Europe and, and the United States, a dream of deep materialism, a dream that depends on oil. Mm-hmm. And so they, they asked us to form an organization, a partnership with them, which is called the Pachamama Alliance, mm-hmm. to help change that dream, to help change that perception mm-hmm. that we must take oil out of the Amazon and many other places. And so these, 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 these uh, tribes, which now are actually recognized as nations, mm-hmm. came together, ancient, ancient enemies, terribly strong enemies for, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. They, they changed all that. They changed their perception. No, our neighbors are not our enemies. We, we've got to come together with them to, to really attack the real problem, which is the perception of the world uh, of, mater- of deep short-term materialism. Mm-hmm. And if these can do that, if these tribes that have been enemies for so long can change their perception and their way of recognizing and working together there's no reason why countries like Russia and the United States, who were allies during World War II, uh, can't come together and work together. After all, if we were now Germany and, and, and Japan were our enemies in World War II. They're now allies and friends. Right. We, we work closely with them. Russia was our ally, and now it's our enemy. Uh, things like that change very quickly. Right. So we all need to come together and recognize that, that we've got to make a concerted effort uh, to create this life economy that I talk about. So... How do you overcome that ideological divide when you are dealing with, let's say, the Middle East and there seems to be such a misperception on either side? How do you, how do you work toward a solution? Well, we, we, I think you know, we each keep pushing for it. And as I mentioned earlier, every individual has a different way of doing it. So mm-hmm. some people may work hard for nonprofit organizations that, that, that do this kind of thing. Some people may do podcasts like you. Some people mm-hmm. may write books like me, but we all do what it is that we feel most comfortable doing mm-hmm. to make that happen. And, and to realize that it really is only about changing perception. This is not a difficult issue. When you come right down to it, perception change can happen very, very quickly. And it has. Look at <laughs> 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Who would have believed that the transgender movement would have reached would have been as successful as it is today? Mm-hmm. I mean, ten years, even five years ago. Right. And I mean, the whole uh, 
the whole community that revolves around all the sexual issues that mm-hmm. we deal with today, transgender, uh, you know, the, the, the LTBG community, um, that when I was in college, that would have, what's, what's happened would have been totally unthinkable. Mm-hmm. And even 10 years ago, much of what we have today would have been unthinkable. That's changed extremely rapidly, mm-hmm. very rapidly. And we can say the same about so many, many different things. Um, Here's an example. Well, here's a couple of examples. So before Copernicus, human beings thought that the whole universe revolved around the earth. And that perception made us think of ourselves as gods, basically. Very, very powerful. We control the earth. The earth controls the universe. And then when Copernicus said, no, 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 the earth revolves around the sun, the sun revolves around uh, around the galaxy, mm. uh, it changed everything. It changed religion. It changed our approach to mathematics, our approach to science, our approach to how we look at ourselves on this planet. Mm-hmm. Another example, 1773, everybody in the America thought that the, 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 the British were invincible, the mm-hmm. most powerful army in the world. There's no way we could stand up to them. George Washington went before the Continental Congress and he said that he remembered a time 20 years earlier during the French and Indian War, the Battle of the Monongahela, when a huge crack British army under the British General Pratt was defeated by a much smaller French and Indian army. And he said, no, the British are totally defeatable, invincible. All we have to do is hide behind trees. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, change the whole concept of war in this country. And it worked. And we go through periods of history that, that, that are just totally changing. Again, we look at President Kennedy saying, you know, we'll land the ban on the moon and bring him back within 10 years. Mm-hmm. It was an impossibility. It seemed like mm-hmm. an impossibility. It happened. And on and on and on. So, you know, we're at one of those times now where consciousness is changing. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we're having this conversation right now, you and I, mm-hmm is an example of that. It's a, it's a symbol of, of that. It's a, it's, it's a metaphor for what's going on around the world. These conversations are going on every everywhere. single country, everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Now, your work with the Pachamama Alliance, and also I believe it's called the Dream Change Organization. Can, can you talk a little bit more in depth about what it is that you do? Yeah, both of these organizations that I, I founded, Dream Change, and co-founded Pachamama Alliance with Bill and Lynn Twist, uh, and that, that, that organization is now in, in, I think, 87 countries, or maybe a couple more by now. Uh, but, but all of these, all of this work started with the people in the Amazon that, that I spend a lot of time with. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm headed next week to, to work to be with the Mayan people, take a group to the Mayan people in Guatemala. I take... I take groups of small groups of people to, to learn, and, and and everybody's invited. All your list names. Just go to my website, johnperkins.org, and you'll see the information. We haven't actually listed next year's trip yet, but we will soon. Uh, and so these organizations grew out of this indigenous concept that the world is as you dream it. That what, mm-hmm. whatever we dream, in other words, whatever we perceive, we can make happen, mm-hmm. and it, it, we do if we take the actions. We so you have to have the dream or the perception. And then you have to figure out what the actions are that you need to take in order to make that happen. And then it happens. Mm-hmm. And so these organizations, uh, Pachamama Alliance, for example, uh, we have two branches, really. One branch works very extensively with indigenous people in the Amazon, hiring lawyers, helping them defend their lands against oil companies in a legal way, not a militaristic way. Uh, and we do a great deal to protect what's called the sacred headwaters of the Amazon. It's mm-hmm. extremely vital, most biodiverse area, perhaps in the world, certainly mm-hmm. in, in the, this hemisphere, probably the world. And the other side of the organization is in these other 87 or some odd countries uh, doing programs called the Awakening the Dreamer program. Mm-hmm. You can go to pachamama.org and, and uh, see these programs which is, is about helping people wake up to the thing that we need to do to change mm-hmm. this dream, to, to, be, to rise to a new level of consciousness and, and start acting in ways that will promote the change to the dream and the change to reality. Now, a lot of the indigenous cultures do use entheogens to achieve that enlightenment. Is that something that, I guess, is incorporated into the Pachamama Alliance or is that really a separate concept? They do, they do what? 
uh, the use of entheogens, ayahuasca, etc.? Oh, well, yeah, and, and these dream cultures often do use ayahuasca, and, and on our on our trips, uh, people have the opportunity to do that. Um, and you know, I, I was trained uh, many years ago as an ayahuasca shaman in the Amazon. I was trained in the Amazon. A shaman saved my life uh, with ayahuasca, so I think it's a it's a great plant. But I also realized that it's not by any means necessary. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can accomplish the same thing. The Mayans accomplished the same thing through their incredibly powerful fire ceremonies. The Kogi of Colombia, where I just came from taking a group there, uh, used what they call pagamentos, payments to the earth, which mm-hmm. are basically meditations going deep into the gratefulness we have for what we're given. So there's there's many different ways to to access this kind of information. Ayahuasca and, and other such, San Pedro and other such plants are part of that. And I think the plant, I, I really think there's a consciousness revolution that's sweeping the, the planet, including mm-hmm. the plants. The plants are coming to, to our assistance too. Goodness. I would like to say, <laughs> I, I would like to say that I, I sometimes find it disturbing that people come up to me and say, hey, I did ayahuasca 20 times this past year. How many times did you do it? Mm-hmm. I say, well, I haven't done it for five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need to. Pro- I'm still processing what I did five. The one, the one dose I took five years ago, mm-hmm. and that's that's the indigenous way of doing it. You don't just it. it you don't take it as a sort of a social event or mm-hmm. something you have to keep repeating. You take it and you 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 get a you get a learning from that. But it sometimes takes several years to go through the processing of all of that. And it's 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 so I, I I do want to caution that I think the plant is is being misused now mm-hmm. uh, in places like the United States and parts of Europe and, and parts of Latin America. Mm-hmm. The indigenous people who, who we take people to, to do it deep in the jungle, uh, they do not misuse it. And uh, they, they know how to work with it very, very powerfully. And, and it's an, it's, it, can be, it can be a great experience. But again, it's, it's, it's not by any means the only, <laughs> the only way to get that kind of information and that kind of experience. Mm-hmm. So certainly to recap, you believe in the evolution of human consciousness and that each one of us can make incremental changes to make that happen. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think it's important that we recognize that it's not just enough uh, not to buy something because you think it's destructive to the environment, but to buy something that's sustainable. Mm-hmm. That's good. Do that. But then you've also got to speak out and you got to tell the corporation that that produces the bad product, why you're not buying it. Mm-hmm. And you gotta tell the corporation that's produced the good product that, that and you gotta encourage them and you gotta let all your social networking circles know, hey, you know, this is a better product than that because they pay their workers a fair salary. They 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 take care of the environment, support this this corporation and and get the message out and let the corporation know you're getting the message out. Mm-hmm. So we, we all have this ability as consumers and some of us as investors or as employees of companies to really push and push and push to get the message out that we're only going to support companies that are making a commitment to move toward a life economy. We, we can't find any companies today that are perfect in that mm-hmm. regard, but we can find a lot that are in the process and that are committed to doing it. We need to push them to, do, to, to work harder to make that happen and support them in that process. I think there's a lot of message of empowerment on the individual level. And I know firsthand you're someone that has experience, um, let's say the arm of military intervention in, in making specific changes in different countries. Do you think our efforts as collective individuals is enough to overcome the military industrial complex? Absolutely. I have no question about that. If I if I had any question about it, I wouldn't be bothering to talk to you or write books or do what right. I do. Um, uh, yes, uh, we and it's it's happened throughout history. Human beings have incredible power uh, to change our perceptions, and through that, change our values and our actions, and through all of that, change reality. We have we have an amazing ability to do that, and we're in the process of doing it again. And I'm extremely. Uh, hopeful that we will do it quickly enough to turn things around before it becomes totally catastrophic. And that is the other alternative. If we don't Mm -hmm. do it quickly enough, if we don't work on it, it could become catastrophic. But uh, we shouldn't focus on the catastrophic side. We should focus on the side where there's a real incredible possibility here to create 
an economic system, a life support system, let's mm -hmm. call it a social uh, a social governmental economic system or systems, many different ones, but all of them aim toward creating a, toward a life economy and, and creating a, 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 an overall system that is itself a renewable resource. And incidentally, that's how indigenous people have always lived. Mm -hmm. they've lived. They've lived as their economies are a renewable resource. It's mm -hmm. exactly what the human beings for, for most of our, the 200,000 plus years that we've been human beings, uh, for only it's only been the last maybe 3,000 where we've where we've moved toward this this area of which we've arrived at now, which has become very self-destructive. This highly materialistic, greedy, destructive way of life. We've, it's been a very very small part of our human history. We all come from indigenous ancestors. We all come from uh, cultures and pasts that were very very renewable. That, 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 that whose the, their focus was on creating long-term benefits for plants, animals, and humans. And that's a concept that we really need to get back to. Amazing. So it seems like there's definitely <clears throat> large groups of people that are aligned with the concept of raising consciousness, evolution, doing your part. It doesn't seem like our leaders and I guess politicians are really on board with this concept. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, there's a Mayan legend that I discuss in some of my books uh, uh, that about a, a time when there was a, a, a brutal, ruthless, materialistic, greedy leader uh, named Seven Macaw, and eventually he was replaced by a, a, a compassionate, loving, spiritual leader uh, named Hunapu. And the way he was replaced is that the hero twins, basically us, boy and girl, the people, mm -hmm. uh, had to step up and cut off the head of Seven Macaw, the mm -hmm. brutal leader. It's it's all very symbolic. Mm -hmm. um, but what the, the 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 legend says is that our leaders will not cut off their own heads. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to do it. Trump is not going to end uh, this death economy, and probably if a Democrat is elected president, that Democrat may may may, may make some a lot of significant changes, but won't actually cut off the head of this life economy unless we of this death economy and create a life economy unless we really push that to happen. We have to push it to happen. I'm always struck by something that Franklin Roosevelt did at the end of World War II. He was meeting with a group of uh, union leaders for the auto industry. Mm -hmm. And as they left the Oval Office and he's shaking their hands and they're on their way out, he says to them, I think you understand now that I'm, I'm for you. I want for you what you want for you and your people. But now you've got to go out and let the rank and file know that they've got to force me to do the right thing. They've got to pressure me to do the right thing. And, and I think that's, you know, it's a very important statement that we need to pressure our leaders. They're not going to do it otherwise. Uh, I, I talked to the head of a big corporation recently, CEO of a major Fortune 100 corporation who said, I get children, I get grandchildren. I want to have my company be a leader in the green economy, but I know that if I lose half a percentage point of market share or my stock prices go down for a short period of time, I'm going to be fired mm -hmm. and replaced by a CEO who only cares about market share and stock prices. But he said, so when you go out, John, and talk to these people, tell them, send me emails send my company emails and get all your social networking to send emails or tweets or, or Facebook, whatever. Send these things in saying, you really want my company to move in that direction. Saying things like, hey, I love the tennis shoes you make or whatever, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers a, a fair salary. Uh, and so I think what we've got to understand is that our, our leaders are actually in very difficult positions often. Mm -hmm. And they need to be pushed. We, the people, need to push them. And when you come right down to it, that's what democracy is all about. I think um, one of the huge areas of interest for me is uh, palm oil. And it seems to be that that's an area where consumers can make a difference. Mm -hmm. If Obviously, if they avoid those products and really reach out to these companies, it seems like it's an area where we can make a difference that will have a huge impact on our planet. But uh, that, yeah, that's true. There's so many areas like that. 
uh, soy is another one. You know, it's destroying vast areas of the rainforest to grow soy. And, uh, you know, we all talk about that there's too many, there's too much beef being eaten. And there's, there's so many different areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think any, any of us need to be totally radical about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've cut way back on eating beef. It doesn't mean I never eat it. I do mm-hmm. sometimes, and, and particularly when I'm traveling to countries mm-hmm. where it's popular. But I've cut way back. And I think we can all take that as an example that we don't have to deprive ourselves of everything. We don't have to be radical. And we do have to change. Mm-hmm. But we we can change in ways that are supportive of a better life for ourselves and others. I think one of the things that politicians kind of talk about is the stability of the U.S. economy. And I think they put kind of this fear into people that if we change our ways, um, we will lose our sovereignty within mm-hmm. the global market. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the U.S. economy is a wreck, incidentally. <laughs> And no matter, you know, I mean, so we, we the, 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 politicians throw around these numbers like, oh, the GDP is doing really well. Yeah, but the GDP reflects the very wealthy. Mm-hmm. As I said earlier, I mean, it's three individuals that have as much wealth as half the U.S. population. If, if, they're, if their wealth is growing at 10 percent and, the, and, the, and half the population of the United States is declining at 3 percent, you're still showing a 7% increase in GDP. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the economy is doing well. It means a few rich people are doing well. Same with the stock market. That's primarily rich people. I mean, I own some stock. You may own some. Mm -hmm. A lot of people own a little stock, but it's the big stockholders that are really benefiting. And things like unemployment. Oh, unemployment's going down. Yeah, but a great many of those people are making $7.5 an hour, and they've they've got two or three kids, and they can't support them on that. So... These figures, these statistics, are often very, very deceptive. Uh, mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is that the average worker in this country is 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 doing no better than he did a few decades ago, mm-hmm. if, you know, on a real basis. And so, you know, I think that's a really important thing for us to look at. Our economy is not giving us security in general. It's mm-hmm. giving a few people a tremendous amount of wealth. But to recognize that these economic statistics are very, very poor measures of how we're actually doing. I'm an economist. I I know how those, you know, my job was to distort statistics Mm -hmm. like that and use them to help big corporations. And that's how they're being used today to a very large degree. You mentioned something about the role of IMF uh, in kind of corroborating some of these projects in terms of taking over and regime change, et cetera. Um, has the IMF evolved or is it a controversial entity? It's still controversial, as is the World Bank. I, I think they're, they're, they are evolving. And I'm not, to, I'm not trying to say that there are a lot of really good people in those organizations, people that believe that they're doing really good things, and some of them are. And I was in that situation where for many years I thought I was doing the right thing mm-hmm. as an economic hitman. Chief, my, you know, my real time was chief economist. Uh, but the organizations themselves have been very, very oriented to helping big business in general, to helping big corporations often at the expense of, of other countries. It's a huge, huge expense of other countries in terms of resources. The rise of China mm-hmm. and the Chinese banks, like the, uh, like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the BRICS Bank, uh, are forcing uh, the World Bank and its sister organizations and the IMF to modify its ways because China's making huge inroads in, in Africa and Latin America. I travel a lot to some of these countries that are that they're saying, well, we'd much rather take loans from China than from, from the United States or, or oriented organizations like the World Bank, because China doesn't have a history of overthrowing our presidents, or they, the China doesn't have any military bases on our soil. The U.S. does. And there's all kinds of reasons that people in these countries are more willing to, to tie into China. I, you know, and I'll say to leaders in these countries, but don't you think China's got the same goal of taking your resources and ultimately it may, it may put military forces on your soil? And I say, well, that could be, but it hasn't happened yet. And the mm-hmm. United States has proved that you do do that. You, you've done it over and over. And so the, the, this, the inroads of China uh, are actually helping our organizations to become kinder. <laughs> And gentler, if you will, because they're having to try to compete with the Chinese, which is a, an interesting turn of affairs here. You know, the rise of, of the Chinese economy, the rise of the power of China around the world is a 
is a fascinating uh, thing to watch. Uh, and, and I think we should be careful not to always paint China as the bad guy. There's a lot of reasons why we might paint China as the bad guy. And I'm not, I'm not trying to defend the Chinese way. They're making some huge mistakes in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And they're also there. They're a fact. They are rising. They've done an amazing job from an economic standpoint over the last, since 1971. We've just seen a huge change in that country. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And we need to accept the fact that they're there. They're growing. They're becoming more and more popular around the world as as an economic power. And somehow we need to figure out a way to work with them and to benefit from, from having that happen. It's so not necessarily easy. And again, I'm not defending a lot of the things China does, but I am saying it's a reality. They're there. We need to face it. We need to, we need to touch that Jaguar. Mm-hmm. It seems like over and over again, you are reemphasizing the power of the individual and the fact that we today need to take action and, and touch our own Jaguars. Whereas, yes. I, whereas I feel like, I don't know if it's a part of cultural training, but I feel like we have been brainwashed that we need a charismatic leader that will solve all of these problems. We need a Jesus Christ to solve all of, all of our problems. And I think it's becoming abundantly clear that we need to find our own Messiah within ourselves to make that change because there's no outside entity that will be able to do that for us. Exactly. You're exactly right. And, you know, um, we're, it's, I think we're at a time in history where, we're, where more and more people are recognizing that, mm-hmm. that the, the, the leaders are extremely human, extremely fallible, and as the old saying goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. absolutely. And we can see this happening over and over and over. And we need to guard against it and realize that, that, we, that the true power, the real power comes from all of us, mm-hmm. each of us individually and the way we may work together. In this time of social networking, too, when we when we combine and collaborate our individual powers and, and movements, consumer movements and, and other such movements, uh, it, it's easier now than ever before. When we talk about a, a revolution, a consciousness revolution, in, in this point in history, we don't need a violent physical revolution. We need a revolution in information. And in perception and consciousness, and it's happening, and we, we just keep we need to keep pushing it to happen f- faster. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for sharing some of your insights. Is there any other messages or anything else you want to uh, tell our audience? Well, I would just like to leave with thanking you for doing what you do, for bringing this message out and continuing to do it. And also to, to say to people, you know, I think we all live in the, we're very blessed to live at this time in history. Mm-hmm. This is an incredible time where we're, where we're recognizing something about what it means to be human on this planet that humans have never recognized before. We're understanding the amazing power we have to, to, to mold reality on this planet. And we're also recognizing that that power has been abused a lot mm-hmm. throughout human history. It's time now to really channel it into to much more productive, beneficial ways. And I'm, by productive, I mean beneficially productive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, I think that we are living at the most profound time ever and that we're all blessed to be at this time and to be able to roll up our sleeves and be part of this consciousness revolution and bring about the change that we want for ourselves individually and for the world. Fantastic. John, um, in the show notes, I'll put your website and as well as some of the resources you have produced in the past, books, etc. If there's anything else you'd like to leave for our audience, please let me know and I'll make sure to include that. Now, if uh, someone wanted to engage with your organization or you personally, is there a way they can reach you? Yeah, if they go to my website, there's a contact uh, page. That's, you know, that they can go to the contact, and that'll go. That'll get. It's, it's an email that'll get to me. They and and I would love it if you, you know, if at some point you could um, flag the new book. Absolutely, the, yes. Touching the jaguar, and it could have a link to, you know, any of the online. Or uh, we, we like to link to a bunch of them, indie indie books, indie bound, 
Amazon, Barnes and Noble, whatever. So I guess people can pre-order it now. Is the link available already? It's it on pre-order. Okay. So they won't get it today, but they'll get it the first day it comes out. And from my standpoint, that's very important because that helps it get to the bestseller list. Oh, that's great. Good to know. Yeah. Good point. Absolutely. Um, I'll uh, go ahead and put the show notes together and um, I'll contact you just to make sure I have included all the beneficial resources that you'd like to get included. And uh, thank you for setting up our 2020 on a perfect note, I think. Oh, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. I think it's a wonderful message to know that people are empowered, that they can make a humongous difference and they can get started today. Yeah. Well, happy new year and keep doing doing this great work you're doing. Thank you, John. We'll speak soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.